They're kicking us all out. They're kicking out the whole community. I've been here for 50 years. Here in Mexico City, the value of my dollar goes way further. They rent Airbnbs. They pay in dollars and in euros. I can't go back to New York because, I, I honestly, I can't afford to live there now. They're stealing my space. I could be a part of the problem, but I don't, I don't really know. We're breaking history here in Canada. It's the largest First Nation land development in Canadian history. When you build giant towers next to very small housing that's existed there for, for decades, people are going to be upset, and they are upset. We're here addressing the housing crisis. They should know it's Squamish Nation land, and we're back. It's way too big, way too tall, way too dense. You don't like it? Move on. Hola. Hola. <laughs> They're going to throw me out because of digital nomads like you. Leave Mexico. Who gets to decide what happens to our neighborhood? And to us. We all need a roof over our heads. But housing's also a big business, and that means big conflicts. Good afternoon. Okay, one bedroom. Furnished? Sorry to bother you. I see you've got an apartment for rent. Thanks so much. Wow. Wow. 60,000 pesos. Years ago, I was paying 4,000 pesos. My rent is now 7,500 pesos. But if I wanted to rent another apartment like the one I have now, it would be 45, 50,000 at least. As soon as the pandemic ended, we were invaded by digital nomads. Property owners started selling off everything. And we're home. I would call myself a typical digital nomad, because I'm able to work from anywhere. My name is Casey Urban. I work as a travel blogger. My company is called Follow the Fro Tours. For example, I went to Antarctica last year and I had 63 people come with me. I like connecting with others. I think that's the thing that drives me to keep traveling. When I'm traveling, my phone is kind of attached to me at all times. I, any moment could be an opportunity to create some content. I'm staying in Roma again, which is one of my favorite parts of the city. There's few places I would consider to have as a home base, and Mexico City is one of those places I would consider. I don't feel like I'm an outsider. Um, I do feel comfortable here, and I feel welcomed. I live in Roma. It's a very quiet, very safe neighborhood, which is a pretty rare thing for Mexico City. The neighborhood used to belong to us. Now, we're at the mercy of the digital nomads. A lot of digital nomads like Roma. It's an easy place to walk around. There's so many cafes to go to if I want to get work done. It's an easy place to live, especially as a digital nomad. I've looked for other apartments, but there's nothing I can afford here. Prices are sky high. Mexico officially considers housing a human right. So why can't Maripaz afford to live in her own neighborhood? Mexico City, like most cities around the world, is not building housing fast enough for its growing population. The competition for living space is fierce, especially in trendy neighborhoods like Roma. And landlords know they can make more money with short-term rentals to people like Casey than renting to locals. Mm. 
Yo llego a, a vivir aquí. I moved in here 20 years ago. For me, my home is my refuge. Es mi santuario. It's been the center of my family life, where I raised my son. Where I've had times of happiness, also plenty of sadness and problems too. But even so, it's my space, my refuge. The landlord was a kind man, but he died. His sons came to tell me they wouldn't be renewing my lease and that everyone had to leave. They're going to turn everything into Airbnbs. All my neighbors got scared and started looking for places. Not in this neighborhood, of course, in other areas. There's no space left for us. If we weren't homeowners today, you know, our past would be completely different. We rented one bedroom before we had children. It felt like 85% of our income went to rent. I love my neighborhood. I love my city. I live in Kitsilino in Vancouver, and I'm very, very fortunate to have uh, purchased a, an apartment back in the 1990s when it was still slightly affordable. And we had some help from my parents and um, we just put our minds to paying off the mortgage. We have a very lovely property and it's gone up astronomically in value. The house was basically gifted from my father's best friend who'd passed away. It opened many doors for us. <laughs> We've got extreme competition for um, any housing, but particularly for affordable housing and it's only getting worse over the last 30 years. This is the most expensive city in Canada because we really are faced with some real restrictions. We have the American border to our south, we have mountains to the north, we have the ocean to the west, and then we have a long valley to the east, so that's the only place people can really expand. Or you can concentrate and you can also build up. Nowhere to go but up? Vancouver's population is growing, and the city needs more apartments, but there's hardly anywhere to put them. When Vancouver was built, single-family homes like these were the norm. Now, these houses take up huge parts of the city, and only the wealthy can afford them. Vancouver has been ranked as one of the world's most livable cities, but livable for whom? Vancouver is in a housing crisis. A lot of people want to live in Vancouver, but you basically have to be a millionaire to live here. My name's Wilson Williams. Swelchten is my ancestral name. I'm an elected councillor for the Squamish Nation. If you were to venture on an airplane 2,000 years ago, you would see just green and forest. There would be villages filled with longhouses. Uh, canoes uh, that went for blocks on the beach. You would come across our people. We have a sad history of the way that Indigenous people were dealt with by settlers in the early parts of, of first contact of centuries ago. You know, we can't go backwards and, and play it differently. For us to be forced out of our lands, it's still very raw. You know, it's just over 100 years ago. It kind of takes away your identity. Where do you belong if someone tells you you don't belong here anymore? I would almost compare it to our homelessness today, where people just have nowhere to go. And, you know, they land in these statistics where there's 30% of people incarcerated are Indigenous. Our nation needs money. This is what we need to survive. We just opened transitional housing in our community, which serves those who are coming in and out of incarceration, those with mental health issues. 
you know, homeless and addictions, drugs, alcohol, whatever it may be, even prescription drugs and whatnot. Yeah. Mm. But the safe place for them to be and for us to check on them. Hey, Tess, how you doing? One of my distant cousins never had a place to call home since her childhood. This is a lady who's been displaced and couch surfing for 18 years. It's That's nice to have a roof over my head and it's, yeah, I'm super it's duper been... happy. Yeah, a lot of us were struggling, but I think I made it. I imagine a place for a people not struggling in poverty. A home is the most important thing you can have. A roof over your head to sleep, to take shelter. What is home? Uh, it's a hard question for me to necessarily answer since I've been nomadic for eight years. Do I know all aspects of Mexico City? Definitely not. Um, the, the parts I see are the nice parts. I love being a digital nomad. You get to interact with people, learn a new culture. Cheers. I will eat anything. I will at least try everything at least once. Not bad. Traveling makes the world a better place just because it makes you more open-minded. If you have the opportunity to do it, it's great. We got a rica. I've never traveled outside Mexico. Super Barrio is an activist who defends tenants' rights. Without his help, I don't know how I would have managed. Come on in, Super Barrio. Thank you. There are two ways this could go. One would be that you manage to negotiate getting your lease renewed. The other, the one you have to watch out for, is that they might send thugs, people to evict you by force. They were threats from the landlords that they were going to use violence to throw us out. Super Barrio told me, don't worry, you're not leaving, you're staying. Let me show you the photo. I didn't tell them I put up cameras. That's an obscene gesture. They want to intimidate me. I'm trying to be brave. I have to go to court in a few days. They're starting a trial to evict me. This should have never happened. We never should have been kicked out of our own territories, our own village. Sanak was burnt down. This was one of the last villages in Vancouver we were expropriated from, and probably the most hurtful. The indigenous people, our nation, we were an inconvenience. Our natural way of being and living and surviving off the land wasn't the way of the future, according to the government, so we were removed. But you also see the looks of hope, the hope for the future, because there's plans in place. Sanok is the biggest First Nation land development in Canadian history. It will have 6,000 plus units, housing over 9,000 people. 250 of those units will be for Squamish Nation members. My heart grew two sizes knowing that we're back in our territory and I can prepare to live back to where my grandfather lived in Sanok. I think a lot of people in Vancouver, when they see the size and scale of this, are gonna be shocked and, uh, and not happy about it. Even if people are upset, the Squamish can legally build whatever they want here in what is now the middle of Vancouver because Sanok is their reserve land. 
The Canadian government took it away in 1913, but the Squamish won it back in court in 2001. And they got a billion dollar government loan to build the towers with help from a luxury real estate developer. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called the project Reconciliation in Action. Reconciliation is not simply putting up massive towers and making a lot of money. That's what developers do all around the world. Our people have been here for almost 2,500 years now. We're revitalizing that history, but at the same time creating that economic wealth. It's built on First Nations reserve land, so the city doesn't have any control over it. The regulations don't apply, the height limitations. Whoa, this is maximizing density to the next level. It's so good to see the cranes, hey? Eh? Yeah. Holy, eh? Yeah. Even though people aren't gonna be used to it around here, you know, it's the new way of the future, right? No longer being out of sight, out of mind in the, in the city of Vancouver in our own village. Vancouver definitely needs more housing, but we don't need more expensive luxury high-rise towers in Vancouver. There are lots. We need cooperatives, we need other types of housing. Ultimately, I think governments are going to have to provide housing for middle-income people for this city to continue to work and function. Otherwise, we're doomed. Where am I going to go? My things will be on the street. And I'll go to a hotel, an old folks' home. Even those cost money, so the street it is. Cheers to new friends in Mexico City. Cheers. As someone who's been traveling for so long, finding community is like the thing I yearn for the most. One reason I do like Mexico City is they do have uh, quite a few digital nomads. I started traveling back in 2015. Everyone was just like, how do you afford to do this? How, how can you do this? And my answer was always, traveling's way cheaper than my rent in New York City. The US is very hard to live in in any single city. Our rent is going up too. Like, we can't live in our own country because it's unaffordable getting paid the salaries we're getting paid in our own currency. That's insane. My life before traveling was quite different. My goal was just to make a lot of money. My network as well was this bubble of overachievers, finance people, living in New York City, living their best life. When I left New York, I gave my furniture to some friends. I was like, hey, you guys can hold on to this for a year. I have no idea where that furniture is now. <laughs> David is my neighbor. Well, he was. He lived in the building next door. I threw out the last bag of trash today. Overnight, the lease ran out and everyone in the building had to leave. This kind of gentrification, throwing people out and turning apartments into Airbnbs, it's a big business. And I can't go back and start over again. I'm not 20 anymore. But I'm going to fight till the end. Till the end. I'm not sure if there ever was a point where I realized I wasn't going to do one year. Um, my travels kept extending by accident. And somehow it's ended up being eight years. Um, and what I realized is the best plan is no plan. I just learned how to live on a budget and seasonal work. But, but I was living probably off of $10,000 a year for about five years. Now my budget, I probably spend closer to around $30,000 a year. I'm pretty sure my friends in New York are working a lot more than I am. <laughs> When my neighbors were still here, we were like a family. We'd get together to celebrate Christmas and New Year's, eat our Three Kings Day cake together. Now I'm alone. I don't have anybody. My neighbors didn't come together to fight it because they're cowards. I'm not a coward. Oh, oh.
This is a battle for the soul of Vancouver, really, what's going on. And it's not a battle between Indigenous people and other nationalities. It's a battle between developers who put profits ahead of everything else and ordinary people who want to see affordable, practical housing that, that works for people. For us, looking at it through, you know, an Indigenous lens, we are putting ourselves in a position of strength. The Squamish want to build even more towers here on this former military base called the Jericho Lands, located on traditional First Nations territory. They're teaming up with two other Indigenous groups and the Canadian government. The plan is to build apartments for 28,000 people. The tallest three towers would be almost 50 stories. This is really just pure irony. Help us shape the future of the Jericho Lands. Neighbors said, this is too dense, this is too high, it's too many people, it's too tall. And what happens? It comes back with more units, higher density, higher heights. That's shaping the future. Jericho is gonna be a huge staple for the future. We're changing the evolution of our people. We're changing lives. There's going to be subsidized rental units for our people. There's going to be a vibrant community where we can live, work, and play all in the same area. A lot of people live in Vancouver because it has this natural balance of park and green space and ocean and mountain and sky and everything else. And all of a sudden, it's like, no, you don't have a choice. This is going to become one of the densest areas in the world. And there's three 49-story towers, and there's 60 high-rises, 13,000 units, 28,000 people. Well, when you build 49-story towers in uh, this city, you're mostly likely to sell to foreign investors. I mean, that's just the reality. Certainly, you're going to be selling to very rich people. I'm just worried they're going to knock down all the affordable housing and build up a lot of towers that aren't affordable. I knew it was going to be big. I didn't know it was going to be 49 stories big. So like, as a young person, housing in this place must be insane. Yeah, it's, it's almost impossible to yeah. someone like me. Like, I grew up here, and I, I would love to live here, but it's yeah. like, I don't see any prospect of that. A lot of young people are leaving the city, leaving their parents behind because they can't find anything. They don't see a future here. And that's, you know, a, a crying shame. A lot of the residents here have a lot of history here as well. They probably have a, a few generations that have a property and have, have lived here. It looks like our neighborhood is going to be completely transformed in a very negative way. We listen as, as good neighbors, but, you know, we were never in a place to tell them what to do. We're the underdog. We're, we're David versus Goliath here, not the other way around. Also, we've proposed alternatives. We worked with architects, planners, people who are very much involved in development themselves to develop an alternative proposal, which is all low rise. Bill's part of a group called the Jericho Coalition. Here's what they say the indigenous developers should build here. All four to eight stories, no towers. They call it human scale housing and they say it's more environmentally friendly. Their proposal has apartments for 16,000 people. That's about half the number the current plan would house. I, I really feel strongly, my wife feels strongly, that people have to stand up and say, this is too much. We're yep. still alive and well. Still have housing. Still have housing. Cheers. I shall put it in the middle of the Jericho plan. Oh, that's about the size of the tower. And there will be no light on this park ever again once this is well, built. Well, it's going to certainly cast shadows. I yeah. will be out picketing every day if this truly goes ahead. I will be out every day on 4th Avenue with my picket sign mm, diligently. Okay. okay. Yeah, I can do it. I will do it. Hearing stories about people who are being pushed out of their living situations, um, it might be like hard to relate because I've never been in that situation before myself. Ever since the situation with the house started, I can't sleep. I go to bed very late, four in the morning, just tossing and turning, thinking, what am I going to do? What's going to happen today? Horrible depression, anxiety that I wouldn't wish on anyone. It's been the toughest year of my life. 
tengo I'm scared. mucho miedo. I'm terrified tengo of what might happen. Rent is going up. Do digital nomads have an effect on this? I definitely think we do. Uh, but I also think it's a global phenomenon that's happening around the world. I don't want to be a part of the problem of making housing unaffordable. Maripans, ¿quieres venir? Hola. Hola. <laughs> Casey. ¿Cómo estás? Casey. Mm -hmm. Bueno, bueno, ¿y tú? Me comentan que ella es mi vecina. I heard you're my neighbor in Roma. What do you think of the neighborhood? And how you guys are invading and kicking us out? People like me, old people, you're destroying our lives. We just wanted to spend our last days here in peace. Instead, we're suffering because of you. I see that your your love for um, your home where you're living. Um, I see I see your your pain. She sees my pain, but who's going to help me? I'm alone at this age. I'm not her age anymore. If I were, I wouldn't worry. But what am I going to do on my own? I've been crying for an entire year. Is there anything that, is there any message that I can share um, to um, my counterparts? Leave Mexico. Leave Mexico. Leave. We don't know how the world's going to be 10, 50, 100 years from now. We need to plan. We need to look at what it's going to take for our people to continue to survive beyond natural disasters, beyond further impositions of our people. We got to prepare for that. We'll stand tall and proud back in our own territories for many, many years. Neighborhoods should be allowed to have significant input in what happens in their community. We are trying to find a place where everyone is treated equally and fairly, and that's not what we're feeling about this proposal. Indigenous people have been displaced, and we need reconciliation. We need to try and fix generations of problems, but it doesn't simply come from profits. One question, if um, you're open to sharing your contact, um, I would also um, like to share some of your story with my audience, if you're okay with that. Con su audiencia. Claro. Sure. Sí. Yes. Sí, sí, sí. Yes, we can. Sí. Sí. <laughs> sí. 